This, as you know, is the first Sabbath in December, and of course this is the beginning of the season when people start thinking of the first advent of Christ. I imagine that quite a few people have gotten out their advent calendars and started the countdown to Christmas Day, especially the children among us. But um, unfortunately, most of the world, at least it seems, has been thinking more about Santa Claus and Tinsel than it has about Jesus Christ. But we as Adventists are firm believers in the first advent of Christ, for sure, and we steadfastly live in anticipation of the second advent as well. Yes. But what, what does it mean to live in anticipation of the advent of Christ? Of course, the word advent isn't in the Bible, uh, but we know it refers to the coming of Christ. Now we can think of Christ's coming from three different perspectives. First, there would be the first coming of Christ that uh, we celebrate at this time of year, the Nativity in Bethlehem. Secondly, there's the coming of Christ into the heart of the believer. And thirdly, there will be the second coming of Christ in the clouds of heaven at the end of this earth's history. And all three of these are important. So today, I would like for us to take a look back at the first advent of Christ with the goal of reaffirming the reception of Christ in our hearts today so that we may live in anticipation of the second coming of Christ in the future. So if you were to sit down and read to your family the Christmas story, you most likely would start reading in the book of uh, the Gospel of Luke. The book begins with a story of devout people who were living in anticipation of the coming Messiah and the kingdom of God. As we look at these stories of these Bible characters, Let's see what practical lessons we can learn from them about the kingdom of God. Now that term, the kingdom of God, is a phrase frequently used by Jesus in his teaching. And Luke uses the phrase in his gospel 31 times, more than twice as many times as all the other New Testament writers combined. The kingdom of God is a concept that at times runs parallel to that of Advent. We can think of the kingdom of God as a description of God's sovereign rulership of his people, whether that is in a, in a general way throughout all history or in our own lives and in our hearts as individuals or on a cosmic level that will be most fully realized at Jesus' second coming. The concept of the kingdom of God seems to have been formulated by the time of King David. For we read in Psalm 45, 6, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. And later, as recorded in Daniel 2:44, the prophet says, that the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. The time of the Savior's advent was also revealed by Daniel in the prophecies of chapter 9, but not all rightly interpreted the message. And certainly the grandeur of the kingdom of the coming deliverer that the Jewish nation imagined was of a different nature altogether from what Isaiah described in the 53rd chapter of his book, when he spoke of the Messiah being despised and rejected by men, and of his soul being an offering for sin. At his first coming, the King of Glory did not come with royal display. Rather, he stooped low to take humanity he shunned all outward display. 
Jesus proposed that no attraction of an earthly nature should call men to his side. The character of the Messiah had long been foretold in prophecy, and he desired that men accept him based upon the testimony of the word of God. But when angels came unseen to Jerusalem, to the appointed teachers of the sacred scriptures, to the very ministers of God's house, they found them not prepared for the revelation of the Messiah. And so it was that the angels turned to those who were sincerely desiring the coming of the promised Redeemer. Among these were the aged prophet, or the aged priest Zacharias and his wife Elizabeth, Mary and Joseph, the shepherds in the fields outside of Bethlehem, and Simeon and Anna in the temple. These are the characters with which Luke begins his story. These are the first to receive the good news from heaven, and even though they do not know it, and they certainly don't yet understand it, they are about to be introduced to the kingdom of God. Luke tells us in chapter 1, verse 2, that he received a narrative of the things of which he was writing from those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses. And the closest witness, the best one to remember all of these stories from the beginning of Jesus' childhood and even before, would be none other than his mother, Mary, the mother of, uh, the, none other than Mary, the mother of Jesus. This is why many through the centuries have believed that Luke consulted Mary in writing his gospel. The twice repeated statement in Luke 2, 19 and 51, that Mary kept all these things, as it says in the King James Version, or treasured up all these things, as we see in some more modern versions, treasured up these things in her heart seems to confirm the idea that Mary was Luke's source for these early parts of the story. Through Luke's account, we are allowed to treasure the very same things that Mary did. And so this morning, we're going to specifically look at the gospel stories in which Mary, the mother of Jesus, was a key figure. And also, think about how the main characters in the narrative might have developed a deeper understanding of the kingdom of God. In Luke 1.28, we are told of the gentleness of the angel Gabriel as he greets Mary. Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And when the angel saw that she was troubled by his words, he gently quieted her fears. Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will, drain, he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary, who was probably a teenager, believed the angel's announcement unhesitatingly, her only question being about the process so that she could understand what her role would be. How can this be, since I do not know a man? Luke, being a physician, must have had the same question. The angel patiently answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And then, as if to inspire her with where she should turn next, where she could go for counsel and support, the angel continued, Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is now the sixth month with her who is called barren. 
for with God nothing will be impossible. In response, Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. The matter was settled as soon as it had become clear to her what God's will was. Calmly, submissively, obediently, and matter-of-factly, Mary embraced her destiny. Unfazed, it would seem, by the prospect of short-term embarrassment, of that short-term embarrassment that the virginal pregnancy was sure to bring, she was dedicated, surrendered to her high calling, and willing to face anything that might confront her. By placing herself in God's will, she was embracing the kingdom of God. And what an example for us. If it hadn't been for Mary, it is likely we would not have the story of Zacharias and Elizabeth and the birth of John, the forerunner of Jesus. How thoughtful of God to arrange for Mary's elderly relative Elizabeth to become pregnant six months before the angel appeared to Mary and then to tell her about it. That gave her a reason to travel over 80 miles to the home where she would be sheltered and nurtured during a difficult and lonely time. Since nothing is mentioned about Mary's parents, it is possible that she was an orphan, or at least had no mother by this time in her life. The instruction she would receive in following Elizabeth's pregnancy through until the delivery of her promised son John was a great preparation for what she herself would experience six months later. And the fact that Zacharias was not able to speak and likely not able to hear during those months gave the two women plenty of time to talk together about the joys and responsibilities of motherhood. God had thought of everything. Let's read of Mary's encounter with Elizabeth in Luke 1, 42 to 55. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord." If Mary was still in her heart seeking confirmation of the amazing announcement she had received from the angel, she surely got it from Elizabeth. It seems she told Luke all about it, and Luke included it in his gospel. Luke also included the psalm that Mary must have composed at that time. It is likely that she had kept this song by her as something private, until she let Luke have it for his gospel. The poetic quality and grandeur of her song tells of the mighty acts of God in her and among the generations and in Israel and everywhere the covenant of Abraham extends. The topic of this song, or the Magnificat as it is called, is once more the kingdom of God and the revolutionary mercy and justice churning within it. We can read it in verses 46 to 55. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly estate of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. 
He has scattered the proud in the, in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has not sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, and he spoke to our fathers, or as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. Although Luke doesn't say so, Mary must have stayed for the birth and circumcision and blessing of the miracle baby John, who would later be known as John the Baptist. Otherwise, who would have been able to report the beautiful prophecy given by, by Zacharias when his voice came back to him? We can read part of that prophecy in verses 76 to 79. <clears throat> And you, child, will be called the prophet of the highest. For you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death, to, guard our, to guide our feet into the way of peace. John the Baptist was to be the forerunner of, of Jesus, the herald of the kingdom of God, the one who would one day cry out, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Then comes the story of Jesus' birth in the second chapter of Luke. Here we are shown the apparently uncomplaining resourcefulness of Mary, making a cradle out of a cattle trough, we can guess that she brought the swaddling cloths with her in case the birth happened while they were traveling. Perhaps she and Elizabeth prepared the clothing for their babies together during Mary's visit with her. It is easy to imagine Mary's sweet memories of her first motherly instincts as she tenderly wraps her new baby for the first time. Also, we are told of the shepherd's visit and what they told Mary about seeing and hearing the angels celebrating the Messiah's birth. When at Jesus' birth, the angels sang, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men, they were but declaring the principles of the law which Jesus had come to magnify and make honorable. They were praising the principles of the law of the kingdom of God. Simply put, the first four commandments tell us to give glory to God in the highest, and the last six tell us to live at peace and with good will toward men. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. And Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Next in Luke's telling of Mary's story comes the naming of the child at the rite of circumcision a week after his birth, and 33 days later the visit to the temple after her 40, day, 40 days of purification in keeping with Levitical law. There in the temple she meets with Simeon, who told her with enig enig enigmatic grandeur that her son would be a controversial and embattled figure, and that a sword will pierce through your own soul also. Then came the meeting with Anna, the aged prophetess, who began to give thanks to God and to speak of him, that is Jesus, to all who were waiting for the redemption of, Jeru in the, for the redemption of Jerusalem. Not only are these important aspects of the story of redemption for us to study, but they were very significant events that confirmed Mary's growing understanding of the specialness of her son, his deity, and his destiny. She was learning more of the nature of the coming kingdom of God, and it was not going to be an easy road ahead. The last of Mary's reminiscences, 
as recorded in the second chapter of Luke, is the story of how at 12, Jesus was carelessly left in Jerusalem when his parents departed with their family group to return to Nazareth. He was eventually found in the temple by his parents asking and answering questions with the theological leaders of the nation of Israel. We don't know what Mary or Joseph had or had not told Jesus about his paternity, but whatever they had told him, his surprising question, did you not know that I must be about my father's business, must have taken their breath away. As Luke says, they did not understand. Really, they had no idea how much Jesus' words might imply. Again, this surely must be Mary's story told to Luke, who once more records what she treasured up in her heart. The only other mention of Mary in the Gospel of Luke is in chapter 8, verses 19 to 21, where Jesus apparently declines to break off his teaching session because his mother and brothers have arrived and are asking, one supposes, for some family time with him. Jesus simply says, My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. And then one imagines, carries on. In this incident, Jesus' mother, middle-aged Jewish mother that she is, is learning to be Jesus' disciple. And just as Hannah resolved to lend Samuel to the Lord for life, so she is resolved to do the same with Jesus. Since he is certainly a prophet, quite apart from the royal destiny that Gabriel had marked out for him, Mary is resolved always to be guided by his word. And just, at the mo announce, just as at the announcement by the angel of Jesus' birth, she was again, in essence, saying, Let it be to me according to your word. Mary was yet again learning the lessons of the kingdom. In a similar vein, there's another story from earlier in, Genesis, earlier in Jesus' ministry, this time recorded in the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 1 to 11. Here we watch Mary, a model for us, as she learns yet another lesson of submission. It is the story of a wedding feast saved from disaster by the miraculous provision of a huge quantity of excellent wine. This was the occasion of Jesus' first recorded miracle and carried deep symbolism and significance. Yet at the heart of it is an exchange between Jesus and his mother that either John overheard or learned later from Mary herself. Mary tells Jesus they have no wine. She doesn't know what he can do about it, but her words show that she thinks he can do something about it and is asking him to take some action. Jesus' reply has caused head scratchings. It seems, it may, or it may seem like a brush off, but it is actually just the reverse. In essence, he says, dear lady, do you not realize that we're not on the same page here? My appointed time for taking action has not yet come. He is reminded her, he is reminding her in the gentlest possible way that she must not try to manipulate or program or otherwise control him, for he marches to the beat of a different drummer. She must deny herself the privilege ordinarily allowed a Jewish mother, and so the conversation ends but her hopes of some action on her son's part do not end, as her words to the servants show, and in that she is not disappointed. But think about it. Aren't we a bit like Mary in some of our prayers, thinking we can put a little pressure on the Lord to get what we want? More often than we think, perhaps, we tell the Lord what to do because we know that it is within his power to do as we want, rather than seeking for his will. 
At the end of his ministry, we see Jesus making his way to Golgotha. His mother, Mary, had followed the steps of her son to Calvary. With the disciples, she still cherished the hope that Jesus would manifest his power and deliver himself from his enemies. How could his kingdom come if he was in the grave? That thought only added to their grief. Then the, the beloved disciple John gives us a view of a tender moment that occurred between Jesus and his mother during those final hours. Knowing that the end was near, John had brought Mary to the cross to be near her son as he breathed his last. Here are his words in John 19, 25 to 27. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour that disciple took her to his own home. This thoughtful care lifted a weight from Mary's mind. She would no longer be obliged to choose her own home and run the risk of offending her relatives. Christ knew what she most needed, the tender sympathy of one who loved her because she loved Jesus. There is only one other mention of Mary in the Bible. In Acts, the first chapter, we find her with the other disciples in the upper room, praying for the coming of the kingdom of God. But before that gathering, Luke tells us, beginning in verse 3, that Jesus presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking, now notice this, of the things pertaining to to the kingdom of God. He then told them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, by which he meant the Holy Spirit. And what was the response of the disciples? In verse 6, we read, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? They're still thinking that the kingdom of God would be established through the restoration of the earthly kingdom of Israel. They knew that Jesus was going to leave them soon, and they wanted an answer to when this would happen before he left them, and it would be forever too late. But Jesus told them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. He told them instead that they were to wait in Jerusalem till they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit and receive power to be his witnesses. So the apostles gather in the city along with certain of the women and Mary his mother and with his brothers. They have no timetable. They are to wait. And while they wait, they pray. Now, given Jesus' frequent teaching about the kingdom of God and the Lord's prayer for the kingdom to come, and Jesus' yoking of the soon-to-be-poured-out Holy Spirit with the restoration of the kingdom, given these things, we may safely speculate that the apostles prayed as Jesus had taught them, and that Mary and his brothers joined them in an atmos atmosphere of expectation and hope. In this pause, come Holy Spirit, and thy kingdom come, thy will be done, merge into one prayer. Then, as Luke tells us in Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind that filled the whole house, and the power came. We're naturally attracted to the wind and fire of Pentecost, but these are only signs that the Spirit of God is stirring. 
The main event of Pentecost is that the Spirit of God cut through the armor of prejudice of a corrupt generation of Jews and hit them in the heart and convicted and saved them. The miracle of Acts 2 is the regeneration of the human heart, a miracle no less spectacular than the creation of the world or the resurrection of the dead. Everything else that follows in the book of Acts is describing the inbreaking kingdom of God. Acts is a book about God. It's called the Acts of the Apostles, but what we really have are 28 chapters of the mighty acts of God done through human ambassadors. And the whole book, one might say, is a record of God's answer to the prayers of those in the upper room. We tend to focus on the people spoken about in the Bible, but those accounts are really about God, God's initiative, God's favor, God's kingdom. And so when in Acts 1, 14, we get our last glimpse of Mary at prayer with the apostles, we can guess the topic. She's been praying for the kingdom of God from the start. This was the cradle in which Jesus was raised. Would it be too much to speculate that Jesus learned, thy kingdom come, thy will be done from his mother? In any event, it is hard to imagine a more revealing and encouraging last glimpse of the mother of Jesus. She had the consolation of Israel in her womb and in her home, but now, like all the others who have had no such distinction, she simply prays for the king coming of the kingdom of God. We could do no better, and may his will be done on earth as it is in heaven.